There's a lot of information out there about empaths and highly sensitive people, but most of it is very disempowering. There's this belief that empaths are fragile little wallflowers that need to protect themselves against outside energies at all costs. There's also a belief that being an empath is some sort of curse. But you know what I think about all these beliefs about empaths? They're total bull****. Oops. Empaths are really powerful beings who can move energy like nobody's business. <laughs> but here's the kicker. They need to heal themselves before they can step fully into their power. And that's exactly what I'm going to help you do in this video. So if you have struggled as an empath, that struggle ends today. Coming up. Hello, beautiful soul. This is Christina Lopes, the heart alchemist here to help you open your heart, heal your past and live with purpose. If you're new to my videos, click on that subscribe button and also the bell. So you get notified as soon as I publish new content. This video is a, the second video in a two part series. And I started this in my previous video. I started this series on empaths and highly sensitive people. If you haven't seen that first video, it's going to pop up right here on your screen. And so I recommend you go see that video. So hit pause on this video, go see that first video, because if you start with this one, you're not going to understand anything because literally this video is a continuation from my last one. Okay. So hit pause on this video and go check that other one out if you haven't seen it yet. In my last video, I talked a lot about four protection mechanisms that empaths use when they are children so that they can survive sometimes their really harsh childhood. And so I'm continuing on that, that, that thread of conversation in this video, and I'm still going to keep talking about the four protection mechanisms. So when I talk about these four protection mechanisms, you'll know that I'm coming from my previous video. I've divided this video in two parts. In the first part of the video, I help you see if you are still stuck in these four protection mechanisms, because like I talked about in the last video, the four protection mechanisms that empaths use to survive their childhood very quickly turn into huge problems for them when they grow up. All right. And I'm going to help you in the first part of the video, understand if you're still stuck in these four protection mechanisms that you should have let go along time ago because they're no longer protecting you. All right. So that's part one of the video is helping you understand if you're still stuck in these protection mechanisms. And the second and most important part of the video, I'm going to help you heal all of the stuff that needs to be healed from your childhood as an empath. All right. So that's coming up in the second part. Once you finish watching this video, let me know in the comments below, which one of these tips that I'm recommending in the video, which ones are you going to start implementing in your life today? Let me know in the comments below. I love to connect with you in the comments and it's a great place for you to connect with others in our community. Okay. Let's get started with this video. Here goes part one. How do I know if I'm stuck in the four protection mechanisms? All right. Before I answer this question, let me just quickly do a review from the last video. Let me quickly do a review and remind you what the four protection mechanisms of the empath are. The first one is premature ego formation. Then we have soul fragmentation. Then we have mental dissociation. And the fourth one is heart closure. Okay. So these are the four protection mechanisms that I talked about in my previous video. Now we now know that when you become an adult, these protection mechanisms can no longer be called called protection mechanisms. They're actually the four reasons why you struggle so much. So I want to help you in part one, understand first, if you're stuck in these protection mechanisms, because you may be stuck in them and not even know. All right. So let me answer this question in more detail now. So here are the six signs that you may still be stuck in the four protection mechanisms of the empath. And those four protection mechanisms have probably turned in to sabotaging monsters <laughs> that are now really affecting your life. There are six signs here. They are the first one is problems with romantic relationships. Okay. So I want you to do a life review and start cataloging your relationships and you will start to see very deep patterns. If you do have one of these protection mechanisms, specifically the heart closure ones. Okay. Why do, why am I talking about problems in romantic relationships? 
because problems with romantic relationships reveal heart blocks. Okay. So if you have, if you look back on your whole romantic history and you find that you have a history of unsatisfying relationships, uh, even abuse, sometimes emotional abuse or whatever patterns, childish behavior. If you have unhealthy relationships, let's just put it that way. If you have lived in unhealthy relationships, you know that this is a sign that you are still living in the protection mechanisms of the empath. They are still wounding you. Okay. So fear of intimacy. If you have fear of intimacy, if you have a fear of being abandoned, if you have a fear of rejection in relationships, if you have a fear of giving love or receiving love, all of these point, all of these problems in romantic relationships point to you still being stuck in the empathic protection mechanisms that your soul deployed as a child. Okay. So that's sign number one. Sign number two is feeling uncomfortable in your body. Okay. Now I remember that I talked about in the last video that all of the protection mechanisms, they, they uh, involve some sort of separation. You're separating yourself from yourself. Okay. And what happens is empaths who go through trauma, who have these four protection mechanisms, when they grow up, they actually develop this discomfort with their bodies. Why? Because the body is the beautiful vessel where you feel emotions. Okay. It's the place where you feel emotions. And if you've been and trying to push those emotions away because they were so uncomfortable when you were a child, because you went through childhood trauma, what ends up happening is that you grow up with complete disconnection from your body. All right. So if you feel uncomfortable with your body, if you have body image issues, if you find yourself weighing yourself all the time or monitoring your calories excessively compulsively, if you really find that you have body issues, Maybe you're uncomfortable going to a dance class or an exercise class because you don't like people looking at you. Maybe you're shy about people looking at you, um, you know, uh, in a group, or maybe you're shy about putting a bathing suit on and going to the beach. Okay. So if you feel uncomfortable in your own skin, if you feel discomfort, some people, they say to me, no, I don't feel uncomfortable at all in my body. I love my body. But then when I ask them to start doing mirror work, they freak out <laughs> and then they tell me, whoa, looking at myself in the mirror is, 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 is very uncomfortable. You see, this is revealing that you are disconnected from your body. Okay. So any type of disconnection from your body, this is especially important for people who have gone through sexual abuse because what sexual abuse in childhood does is it really disconnects you from your body really profoundly. Okay. So if you have a history of sexual abuse, this, this body disconnection may be even deeper uh, than other people who haven't gone through this type of trauma. Okay. But regardless of what the trauma is, you will find that if you are uncomfortable in your own skin, this is a sign that you are still operating with the protection mechanisms of the empath that I talked about in the first video. There's a little side note that I wanted to add here about the disconnection from the body. Okay. This is really to help drive home this issue for you because a lot of people run around and tell me, Hey, you know, isn't it normal for me to not feel comfortable in a bathing suit on the beach if I don't have the perfect body? <laughs> okay. No, it's not normal. It's only normal in a culture where we have been shamed, where we have been taught to not like our bodies, where we have been disconnected from our bodies. Okay. So no, it's not normal. No matter how, what your body size or shape is. Okay. What's normal is for you to put a bathing suit on and feel beautiful beautifully comfortable in your own skin. That's what's normal. Okay. So I wanted to leave this side note here about the body to really drive something home for you because some people say to me, they, they really have a difficult time identifying that they're uncomfortable in their body. But here's the side note that I wanted to leave you. Remember the body is the vessel that feels emotions without your body. You can't feel emotions. So this beautiful body is what creates that biochemistry that we call emotion. So your emotions are felt in the body. All right. If I run away from an emotion, get this. If I run away from an emotion, if I push it away, if I don't like it, if I turn my face, I don't want to look at this emotion. I'm also pushing away and running away from my body. You see, because emotions and body go hand in hand. If I run away from one, I run away from the other. Okay. So really do a little bit of a check uh, on this today. Do a little bit of a check. Even if you think you are not uncomfortable in your body and maybe this sign doesn't apply to you, 
Remember how you deal with your emotions. And if you come to the conclusion that you are uncomfortable and don't like and push away certain emotions, then you know for sure you're disconnected from your body also. Sign number three is being controlling. <laughs> Okay. Now, why is this a sign? Well, you, you, um, in the previous video where I talked about the four protection mechanisms, one of them was the premature ego formation. And what ends up happening with people that have premature ego formation is that they end up growing up to have very controlling egos. Okay. The ego, you know, initially is trying to protect you from harm. Right. But then what ends up happening is that protection mechanism then morphs into a monster basically. All right. So people, People generally have really controlling egos when they, when they grow up after they've lived through, after an empath has lived through trauma, they grow up to be very, have very controlling egos. So if you know yourself to be controlling, if certain things, if everything has to be a certain way for you to be okay, if you have the tendency to want to control people, any type of control is considered a sign that you are still operating with these protection mechanisms of the empath. Okay. So do a review, find out if you're controlling, if you like to have your, your life and your, your environment in exactly a perfect way for you to be okay. You know, if you exhibit any signs of ego control, this is one of the signs. The fourth sign is emotional immaturity. <laughs> okay. Now nobody wants to acknowledge that they're emotionally immature. This is a bit uncomfortable for us, but Hey, I put my hand up and I tell you that when I finally was able to heal myself, I looked back and I really understood how emotionally immature I was. And the reason that emotional immaturity is, is one of the signs is because emotional maturity is really the consequence of the inner child dissociating. Remember when I talked about the mental dissociation in the last video, I said that one of the most common types of mental dissociation was the inner child going way far down into your psyche. What happens when that inner child splits, when there's that split in that psyche, the inner child becomes stunted. And so what ends up happening is you grow up, but that inner child never does. And guess what? She commands your life. She's the one that's making decisions. Even if you don't know it, she's making decisions from that scared, stunted place, that scared, unsafe place that, that she felt when she was a child. So that's why the majority of us that go through this trauma as empaths, we grow up to be very emotionally immature. We have a lot of bonding wounds. Um, we can be very attached in our relationships. We can be very fearful. We can be codependent in relationships. We can just be really scared of our partner constantly leaving us or rejecting us or cheating on us. Okay. We, we don't respond well to challenging life situations. That's a sign of emotional immaturity when you don't know how to respond like an adult to a situation. All right. People who are emotionally mature tend to make big things out of little things. <laughs> okay. That's a sign of, of emotional immaturity. And this isn't a judgment for you. I'm saying all of these things that I'm helping you with, I used to do too. So this isn't a judgment. This is for you to self-evaluate as an emotional adult. Now <laughs> evaluate and see if you're still emotionally mature. If you are, that's okay. All you have to do is you just have to do some, you have some growing up to do. That's all it is. It won't take long because once you notice that, wow, I'm a bit immature when it comes to relationships. And when it comes to life, I'm constantly making like these, you know, big hurricanes when there's no, when there's no hurricane at all, I'm making things way bigger than they have to be. I'm not very emotionally mature. Once you figure that out, then you become mature. So it's easy, but this is another sign that you're still stuck in those protection mechanisms of the empath is emotional immaturity. The fifth sign is feeling numb or lost in life. Okay. And this is a direct, direct consequence of a heart closure. Okay. Cause when you close your heart, you become completely numb and lost. Right. And also this is a consequence of soul fragmentation. Cause when your soul leaves, leaves you a little bit of your soul leaves you, you feel lost. You feel numb as I talked about in the last video. So if you right now feel like life is kind of gray, nothing really brings you joy. You kind of feel numb. You feel blocked. You feel just blah in life. Okay. 
this is a sign that you're still operating in this wounded empath uh, pattern, okay? So check in with yourself. Do you feel numb? Do you feel lost? Um, do you feel blocked? Do you feel like life has no meaning, all right? This is another sign that there's still some healing to do in your life. Sign number six is difficulty feeling and expressing emotions. Now, before you say to me, no, I have no problems feeling emotions. I'm an empath. What are you talking about, Christina? <laughs> Let me give this little side note here because I've had tons of empaths say to me, oh, no, 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 that's not an issue of mine. I actually have the opposite issue. I feel too much. That's partially true, my friend. <laughs> Because here's the thing, wounded empaths, what ends up happening with wounded empaths is we're really good at feeling other people's emotions, but we have repressed or pushed away our own emotions as a protection from our painful childhoods or things that happens in, happened in our childhood. So what ends up happening is the wounded empath grows up to learn how to not want to feel their own emotions. They're still pretty good at feeling some everybody else's, but they don't know how to feel their own emotions, okay? So before you tell me that you have no difficulty feeling emotions, I want you to check this. I want you to check this. If you have difficulties, if you feel, and if you know yourself to kind of be someone that, oh, no, no, I'm not dealing with my own emotions. I don't want to deal with my own emotions. I'm going to go shopping or I'm going to go date someone or... <laughs> I'm gonna do all kinds of distractive things so that I don't have to feel my own emotions. You see, you really don't feel emotions like you say you do, okay? So this sign, difficulty feeling, but also expressing emotions, all right? So if you, you know, let's say you're dating someone and if you have difficulty saying I love you to them, if you have difficulty opening your heart and really expressing how you're feeling, even if it's grief, sometimes you could feel grief, you can feel abandonment. If you have difficulty expressing those emotions to the people around you, this is also a sign that you're still in a wounded state. You're still operating with the four protection mechanisms of the empath, and now it's time to heal them. Now on to part two, and that is how do empaths heal themselves? <laughs> okay, so before I get into to this in detail, because basically you've probably already figured out that the way for the empath to heal is they have to reverse the four protection mechanisms that help them survive as a child. So those four protection mechanisms when you grow up turn into your poison and they sabotage your life. And so to heal, you really have to reverse each one of those four. And I'm going to get into detail on how to do that in a little bit, but I want to leave a side note here because when we get to the part about healing, a lot of empaths are really scared, okay? And the reason that we're scared to heal, to truly heal as empaths is because we intuitively understand that to heal, I have to confront, I have to feel, I have to relive certain things. I have to let certain things from my past come up. And that's really scary for an empath because we know how sensitive we are. And so the fear is literally, I've had empaths say to me before we start doing this work, I've had client empaths say to me, I'm really scared that if I start doing this work, I may die. You see, you see how visceral this is. The empath psyche actually perceives this work as being so dangerous that it can cause them to die. You see, it's something that they bring from their childhood. It's a fear that they bring from their childhood. So I wanna leave a side note here before you start this healing work, just to kind of prop you up a little bit, you know, and help you out, help you understand who you are, all right? There are two things that you need to understand about being an empath that's gonna help you move forward and heal with more power, okay? The first thing is, that you are extremely resilient. You're extremely resilient. Look at this from a broader perspective. Your soul would never choose to incarnate as an empath if it didn't also add to that toolbox resilience, okay? Can you see why? Your soul would be dumb if it did that. Imagine, why would your soul combine empathic abilities with weakness with energy weakness, right? That would make no sense because that would literally be setting you up for not surviving. The soul doesn't do that. So what the soul does when it's picking its characteristics for a specific lifetime is as soon as it chooses to incarnate with empathic abilities, it also throws in the resilience into the toolbox, okay? 
So you, my friend, are not a fragile wallflower in any shape or form. You are extremely resilient. You are ex you're so resilient that you actually survived your childhood as an empath. Think about that. How did you survive your childhood with all of its turmoil, with all of the pain, with all of the trauma? How did you survive that if you weren't resilient, right? You were resilient. Get this in your head and in your heart. You're resilient. You can do this work, all right? The second thing I want you to remember is that you are an energy powerhouse, okay? That's another thing that the soul does. When the soul chooses to incarnate with empathic abilities, it does so not because it's just, oh, I'm just going to throw the empath in there just for hell, <laughs> just for the hell of it. No, the soul throws the empath characteristic in its little box, in its little toolbox for a specific lifetime when it has a mission of service to the planet and to humanity. All right. So you know that if you are an empath, you also know with a hundred percent certainty that you are here to help humanity and the planet transmute and shift energy. That's what you're doing here. So if your soul chooses an empathic abilities in a specific lifetime, it will also come in with an extremely large energy system. You are an energy powerhouse. Your aura is huge. It's powerful. Why? Because if it weren't powerful, think about this. If you have a mission of coming down here as an empath to help transmute and shift energy on the planet, if you came down here with a puny little energy system, would you actually be able to help shift energy? No, on a planet of 7 billion people? No, you would go nowhere. You would just drown. So what the soul does is you come in as an empath, you're extremely resilient, and you also come in with a really powerful energy system. And it's that huge energy system that really helps transform one empath that's empowered can really transform the world. I am, I am certain of this. So imagine how many thousands of people, how many thousands of empaths are watching these videos. You're going to become an empowered empath. And that's thousands of us with huge energy systems helping to transition this planet into love, compassion, and joy. Now let's get to some really practical, actionable advice on how you can start reversing the four protection mechanisms. Okay. So the first one, the premature ego formation. Okay. How do you reverse that now as an adult, now that you know that that's not a protection mechanism anymore, that it's really sabotaging you. How do you reverse this? Well, if your ego is really uh, controlling, if it prematurely formed, it's probably controlling. And the way that you're going to reverse that is you're going to have to soothe this ego down. Okay. You're just going to have to find ways to soothe your ego. I love using, um, soothing mantras. I love using meditation, meditation, <laughs> meditation was just so crucial in my life to quieting my mind. Okay. Meditation. You can use all types of meditation, movement, meditation, all kinds of different meditations. You could do meditations in movement. You could do art or painting or anything in your life, exercise. Uh, some people like to do extreme sports for instance, cause that quiets the mind. You're going to find in your own life a way for you to do practices and activities in your life that quiet the mind. Okay. The more that the mind quiets down, it'll start surrendering. It'll start letting go of control. And the more it lets go of control, the more empower your soul can become. All right. So that's how you kind of start to reverse the premature ego formation that happened to you when you were a child. Now to the second protection mechanism, how do you reverse soul fragmentation? So the reason the, the way that I did this, I did the work of soul retrieval. It's a shamanic practice called soul retrieval. If you don't know what that is, look it up and soul retrieval basically as a practice, what it does is it calls your soul fragments back to you. Okay. It calls your soul fragments back to you. It doesn't matter. However, many times your soul pulled a little bit of its essence out. It doesn't matter. You're going to call them back to you and they will integrate in a healthy and healed way into your body. Soul retrieval can be done in one of two ways. I did soul retrieval myself, but it's because I'm it. Trance meditation is really easy for me. What's called journeying, what shamans call journeying. It's really easy. I go into trance meditation very easily. 
healing myself. So I did this healing work myself, but some people won't be able to do this by themselves. It depends. You're going to have to try. So I want you to look up soul retrieval meditations and you're going to find some soul retrieval meditations, put the earbuds in your ear, sit down, listen to the guided meditation and see if you can do this work on your own. If you cannot do this work on your own, if you're fine, if you're finding that you're really not having success on your own, then I recommend you go online and you are going to look for a shaman in your area that does the practice of soul retrieval. You're going to go to the shaman and you're going to ask them. You're going to say that you're an empath. You had a lot of trauma in your childhood. You feel like your soul has fragmented and you need help bringing those soul parts back. All right. So look for a shaman in your area that does soul retrieval. If you don't know how to do this work by yourself. I did it by myself, but it wasn't really all by myself. I, I give credit to the wonderful teacher, Alberto Villoldo. So I want you to look up his books. If you want to do the soul retrieval on your own, I'm going to leave uh, a couple of his books in the description box below so that you can check his books out. Alberto Villoldo has two books that really helped me do soul retrieval. One of them was actually called soul retrieval. So I'll leave that. The other one is called, I think sage healer and shaman or shaman healer and sage. Uh, I sometimes I get this title, um, wrong, but these are the two books that helped me understand soul retrieval on a deeper level. I'll leave links to that in the description box below. But no matter how you try and do this, the way to reverse the soul fragmentation is to integrate the soul fragments that have left you integrate them back into your life. Okay. Now on to another protection mechanism, which is how do you reverse heart closure? Okay. So you reverse heart closure. You got to open your heart, right? How do you open your heart? There are a ton of ways to open, to open the heart. I'm going to give some suggestions, but you get creative too. So one of the ways is connecting, coming into deep connection and devotion with your body. Okay. Okay, because your body and your heart are intimately connected. When you're connected to your body, you are connected to your heart automatically. Okay. So any type of dancing, um, any type of body work like massage, um, if you're into Tantra, Tantric touch works really well. Um, anything that involves bringing your awareness into your body is also heart work. All right. Uh, you can also do dedicate yourself to the arts, you know, any type of artistic, uh, or, you know, maybe do a pottery class, a painting class. Cause when you are dedicated to, uh, more creative activities, your heart starts to open up. That's your creative portal. Okay. So this, this is another way. Uh, what other way? Oh my gosh. There are so many ways. Meditation too. Um, heart mantras. I love to work with mantras, all kinds of mantras. Heart mantras are more just learning how to speak to your heart and really saying, I'm ready to open my heart. Please show me how really having a communication with your heart. Your heart is so wise and beautiful. It's the most powerful center in your body. In my opinion, <laughs> other spiritual teachers that, you know, think that every, the power is all up here in the third eye and the crown chakra and all that. Everybody wants to go up here. And meanwhile, I really believe that the heart center is the most powerful energy point that we have in the body. So learn how to communicate with it. Ask it to show you how, you know, how am I going to open up? Uh, how do, what do you want me to do to help you open up? Okay. Start having these conversations with your heart. All right. Another uh, exercise that I love using, it's called the heart light exercise. And this was an exercise that I learned from the Institute of heart math. So you may want to look them up, look up heart light meditation, and you'll find some, and it's a great meditation that'll help you visualize a light and this light will start opening up. It's a great, great, um, heart opening exercise. Another thing to open the heart is compassion training. There are actually guided meditations and guided exercises their visualization exercises, they help you work on compassion. And when you work on compassion, you open the heart automatically because that's the portal of compassion. The more compassion you can feel for yourself and for others, the more your heart opens up. All right. So this is just a few of the heart things uh, that you can do to kind of start opening up your heart. The more that you open up your heart, here's what's going to happen when you open up your heart. Remember I talked about this in the past video. When you open up your heart, your connection to the emotional body of your aura, here's the aura again, <laughs> just to remind you, the connection to your emotional body in your auric field will reestablish itself 
which means that you're going to start to feel to feel a whole heck of a lot of stuff. And at first, when you're starting to open your heart, the stuff that you may be feeling may not be great because it may be leftover energy from your traumatic childhood that's still circulating in your aura because guess what? Energy doesn't disappear. It cannot be destroyed. So when you reestablish the connection with your emotional body in your auric field, so that emotional body may initially communicate a lot of emotions that need to be processed like anger, grief, and sorrow, okay? And you have to be really courageous to just stay open and let those emotions process in your heart. Again, you're not going to die. Your heart knows what it's doing, okay? So just let it do this work, all right? Now, the last one is how you help reverse mental dissociation, okay? Now, the mental dissociation part the way that you reverse this is really you do a lot of inner child work, okay? What's called inner child work. The goal is you need to bring that inner child from the depths of your psyche and she needs to unite. Your psyche needs to unite and integrate, all right? So you got to go find that inner child and bring her back up. I do a lot of inner child work with clients and you can do this on your own. You can do this with someone else. But look up inner child meditations and you're going to start to see some inner child meditations. Listen to those meditations. Do that, do that work um, on your own. And basically, I, I want to leave you a note here because a lot of people get this, um, you know, they come to me and they say, my inner child, I've been doing my inner child meditations. She still doesn't want to talk to me. She doesn't want to integrate because when you start doing these inner child meditations, you'll notice if the child wants to integrate or not, if she's running away or if she's coming to you, you will feel this when you're doing these meditations. And so people will sometimes say to me, I've been doing 10 meditations and my inner child doesn't want to integrate. And the reason that this happens is you've got to do something important before. Okay. Here's the side note or the pro tip for you doing this work. The inner child dissociated because she doesn't trust adults, right? She felt unsafe with whatever happened to her in her childhood. She dissociated because she felt unsafe and unheard. Okay. So in order for that inner child to come back, she's got to trust the adult you. All right. And guess what? If you're still an emotionally immature mess, <laughs> do you think your inner child is going to trust you? No way. <laughs> she won't trust you. So before you start doing these inner child meditations and trying to integrate your inner child, my biggest recommendation and the biggest pro tip here is you need to work on becoming a whole adult. An, an emotional adult. And if that involves talking to yourself and saying, no, I'm open. I'm, I'm open to growing up. I'm open to integrating. I'm open to healing. I'm open to becoming this mature spiritual master. The more you do this work, the inner child will start feeling that maturity in you and she'll trust you more and more because at the end of the day, when you go get that inner child to integrate her, you have to go get her and you have to provide her with a sense of safety and that she's heard and she's only going to get that from a mature adult that's healing. All right. She's going to spot you from a mile away. If you're coming to her as a hot mess, don't go to your inner child looking like a hot mess. <laughs> she won't integrate and she won't trust you. Okay. So start doing some of this other healing work before you do the inner child stuff, because that'll make it a lot easier. Okay. So that's a little pro tip for you. But then once you do this, then, you know, start doing the inner child stuff, inner child meditations, bringing the inner child to you, listening to what she has to say, maybe reliving some of the memories that she has and she wants to share with you, writing them down, journaling them. And then eventually you will feel the inner child integrate. It's a beautiful feeling. And you know, when you'll get there, you know, when, she, when she's integrated and you know, when she's whole and the moment that that happens from then on in, you have to promise that part of you that you, the adult is going to take over the show and that the inner child no longer has to make any more decisions for you because you're the adult now. All right. You have to reassure her of this, but that's the work of integration. And I know you're going to get there. Now I want to hear from you, which one of these tips that I uh, talked about in these videos, 
Which ones of these tips are you going to implement starting today? Let me know in the comments below. And if you have a question for me to answer in my weekly videos, leave them also in the comments section with the hashtag AskChristina. Don't forget that hashtag. And head over, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Go over to my website and take my heart quiz to find out if your heart is blocked and what you can do to open it. And if you enjoyed these videos, check it out. There's more over here that I know you're going to love, so stick around. I love you, beautiful soul. I am out.